Hey everybody, St. Paul Peterson, and welcome to episode 35 of Music on the Run. Uh, sitting here back in the basement, you know what? It's warming up finally here in Minnesota. The snow's melted, feels finally like spring. And I've been out running a bunch. I finished my first in-person race, seven-miler, and my time wasn't too bad for an old geezer. Uh, I'm really happy with it. It's got. I'm just got to put some more miles in. Uh, get my base, and maybe I can convince our, our next guest to come up uh, in September and run either the half or the full marathon here in the Twin Cities. Anyways, my next guest is a CMA and AMC and Grammy-winning singer, songwriter, producer, drummer, and guitar player. He's got six number one singles to his credit. He's a runner as well, an outdoorsman. And he hosts his own podcast, and he's one of my dearest buddies on the planet. Please welcome Brian White. Be dub in the house. It's so good to be actually talking to you. We've been trying to lock this down for, I'm embarrassed to say, way too long. I mean, I think, I didn't even want to say how long. It's been a long time. I've I've been trying to track you down. You're a busy guy. You are too. I know. It's, uh. You know, how can you be busy in COVID? What did you do? What have you been doing? Tell, right. Fill us in. Um, gosh, where to start? I mean, obviously, uh, the onset was scary for all of us. We lost all of our work, you know. Um, I, di- I, you know, I think it pushed us all out of our, our comfort zone in a, in a good way. Um, I did a lot, just started doing a lot of virtual things, you know, that I probably wouldn't have thought to do otherwise. I started doing uh, a lot of, you know, VIP meet and greet concert type things. And, uh, and then I did some, you know, live performances, uh, via Facebook and, um, that was kind of in the beginning. And then, um, I've been doing a lot of, you know, philanthropy work with a, with a, a great healthcare system in Spokane, Washington. And uh, it's been super f- fulfilling to be uh, doing that kind of work, which is, you know, uh, connecting them with potential partnerships and, and helping them with some of their musical events that raise money for mental health and cancer research. And so I've been doing a lot of that kind of work to uh, uh, just, you know, stuff that's really fulfilling, you know, when you lay your head down at night, you're like, man, I'm so honored to be a part of that. Um, for instance, like recently, I think you probably saw some of it, but it was kind of my first event to co-produce. Uh, and it was, it was called Heartstrings for Hope. And it was, uh, yes. we did, uh, I, I worked with the Grammys and Multicare Inland Northwest Foundation. And, and it was a virtual concert of over 25 artists from from all these different genres, from Jordan Fisher to, you know, Tim McGraw. I mean, just literally across the board. And it was uh, somewhere in person. We we recorded some of the live performances at the Virgin downtown here in Nashville. And then those who couldn't couldn't be a part of it physically, couldn't be there. They sent in a, a, you know, a video and and it was all for mental health. And so um, I've been doing a lot of that kind of work because that's, you know, I mean, you know, you know, a little bit of my story. So that the mental health stuff is something that's really close to my heart. And so when you're doing that kind of work, it doesn't feel like work because you're so passionate about it. So, you know, I'm, that's I've been doing a lot of that. And uh, gosh, I don't know what I, I'm, I'm on a tour right now with a couple other artists. Oh, and great. It's, it feels good to be back out on the road. And so. Just kind of, I'm, I'm, I've been busy, so I'm grateful to say I've been busy. And you're in my, that beautiful house in Nashville that we're at now, full disclosure here, <laughs> Brian is like my little brother, okay? Uh, and I, I've i stayed with them. We've worked together. We've toured together the whole bit. But uh, how are Erica and the boys? They are actually really good. Um, I say that, but, you know, the reality of our, our past year, we've all had, you know, seasons where we haven't been as good you know it's, it's been a, a trying year for all of us and we've all had our our moments and our 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 months that that you know were very big struggles for all of us but today we're good oh, um, that's my family's good, good. Uh, 
I, I just can't believe how fast my kids are growing. Uh, yeah, I've almost got a senior, pretty close to having a senior. Um, and they're just big, super athletic kids that, that, that inspire me. And, uh, you know, of course, having teenagers is challenging, as you know. <laughs> you're way ahead of me on that. But um, my wife is great. We're all great. Uh, just, you know, keep we just keep moving forward. Please give everyone my love and please save that bedroom for me because I'm I got to get back down to Nashville. We got to run. We got to hang. We have a lot of catching up to do. Oh yeah. Hey, by the way, I've I've been doing pretty well running too. Um I I I think I'm like you when you don't have a a goal of a race to look forward to, sometimes you you have a hard time being motivated, or at least I do anyway. So you said they are they having the race? Yeah. Are, are they have the races this fall? They they just announced about 3 races. So I just told uh, the people at the top of the show that I ran my first in-person race. I think it was called the Shamrock 7. And you know, look, I haven't I, I would have I'd like to be able to tell everybody that I've been running 45 miles a week, but I'm not. So I was very happy to finish. And I actually finished in a in a time that was respectable. But the the most fun for me is the camaraderie of going with the geezers of, the, of gear. I was with my buddy Bill and showing up and seeing other people. And even though we couldn't get near each other and it was super safe, I felt super safe. We had masks on at the beginning. I made sure not to get anybody's way and they limited the entry. And I thought they did a fantastic job, but you're absolutely right. Just having something to look forward to, something to train for. It's a mental thing for me. And yes, so in other words, yeah, they're starting to have races. Are they doing that down in Nashville too? I don't think they're doing the rock and roll this year. I, uh, I, as I understand, it's not happening this year. Um, I did book a, you know, you know, as all of our musician friends know, like a lot of times we'll book a gig that's in conjunction with something and I booked a uh, a gig in Nevada, Iowa, and it's a I think it's a five k. And they asked me if I wanted to run in it, and that's in May. So I'm I, coming. I can I can finally say I'm I'm on a race again, even though it's three miles. It's I'm still I'm going to run it the day of the gig. So super excited about that. Oh, that's great. So you've been have you been training and running? You've been pretty good about uh, getting out in the neighborhood and and running a little bit, or. Pretty good. Um, you know, it's weird. It, it kind of ebbs and flows again. Like when you don't have a goal, you know, other weeks I feel super motivated and other weeks I don't. So I might run 30 miles in a week and then the next week I might run 15 miles, you know, so it's kind of, hmm. but I, I'm, I stay active. I, I'm, you know, definitely running quite a bit. Um, you know, uh, I finally, I got to tell you, I, I've never been a Brooks fan per se, yep. but I did this uh, podcast. It was a Brooks podcast. It was called Running the 615. I don't know if you heard it, man. I talked about you all through the podcast. I'm embarrassed to say I haven't heard it yet, but I'll go check it out. No, it's okay. I, I love being able to, you know, they asked me who who's kind of my running cohort uh, community you know, of accountability friends. And I went through everybody, you know, you and Davide. And I talked sure. about Chicago when we ran Chicago. And I've got um, it on today, my Chicago shirt. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So anyway, uh, I, I got a pair of shoes out of the deal, which is really cool. But I was super honest with, with the guy. I was like, man, I, ha- I got to be honest. I've always been kind of an in, you know, a new balance guy. I've always had good luck with them because it's a really large, something about their toe box just works for me. I've got mm. super wide feet and he goes, give it, give it a try. If it doesn't work, I've got some others that work for you. But anyway, uh, it took me a little while with this pair of shoes that he gave me. And I've, I've been, I'm kind of off to the races with this pair of Brooks and I've never really, I've never really had a lot of luck with Brooks. And so I'm, I've been running these Brooks and they're, they're working for me. So pretty no. cool. You know, I have been a one trick pony with my shoes i don't like change very much either does my bride she's like if it's if it's not broke don't fix it so i've been running a newtons my entire career and i went off a newtons and i started having problems 
And I really don't think it's related to me changing shoes necessarily. It could be to the fact that I run my shoes too far into the ground before I go to a new pair. It could right. be a number of different things. But my my fates, I just absolutely love, and I stick with them, and it works for me. I'm glad to hear that you're having luck with those, though. I may have to, you know, check those out for sure. Yeah. Your knees don't hurt. You're, you're, you feel pretty good, huh? I feel pretty good. I I don't have, I, I mean, I have neck issues. I've, you know, my story, I've, I've had some neck issues since the late nineties. Um, I mean, I feel a little bit of, uh, fatigue in that area sometimes when I run, run and I haven't run, run in a, in a while, but I don't have any, I, I'm afraid to say, but I, I don't have any issues uh, physically, uh, with running. It's, it's, uh, Thank goodness. Now, lifting weights or anything like that, I think it would probably aggravate this stuff. But yeah. running, thank goodness, is the one thing I that uh, you know has not beat me up too bad. I haven't had any knee issues or anything. So, well, I love the fact that we jumped right into talking about running. Usually, we you know it's towards the end of the segment. But you uh, you've been running for how long? I mean, you you haven't run your whole life, have you? No. Um, when did you get into it? I'm going to say, I want to say like 2008 or 2009. Yeah. Sounds, feels right. I did this, uh, you know, my brother really well. Yeah. Uh, my brother, uh, he called me one day and he goes, man, I've uh, had this agent that's looking for an act to, to do the post show at the Oklahoma City M- Memorial Marathon. Right. You want to do it? And so I said, yeah, I'd love to do it. And he goes, well, let's run the race. And I was like, get out of town. No way. I'm not. No way. I hate running. And he somehow over the course of two or three weeks kind of coaxed me into it. Uh, he, he guilted me into it because he said, well, let's do it. And let's raise money for food for the hungry, you know, and, and uh, you know, and we'll, we'll do it that way. And I said, well, I'll, I'll start running with you and we'll see how it goes. And, and uh, it was miserable for a while. And somebody made me go to Fleet Feet uh, here in Nashville. That's, a, you know, that's a franchise. I don't know yeah. if there's a Fleet Feet in Minneapolis no. or not, but they're all over the don't place. But they, you know, like digitally measured my feet, let me run in multiple different pairs. And I mean, it literally changed my life. I mean, changed the whole game for me. And and so my first, that was my first race. We, My brother and I did the half marathon there. And, you know, it's like something just clicked and I, I became, I mean, became a runner and, and like I talked about in this podcast I did, it's, 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 yeah, it's physically, it's great for you, but mentally I'd say it's, it's probably more important mentally. Uh, running is like this tool that I have now. Like if I'm having this really crappy day, I can always go out and run and it, it doesn't make everything go away per se, but it, it, it kind of, it, it, it kind of uh, helps things it helps you to deal with things a little bit, bit better, you know, like you, you told me a long time ago, you just got to move your body at least 25 to 30 minutes a day, you know, and that's, it's just a nice tool to be able to have to sort of, you know, go out and air it out and make yourself uh, better, you know. Right. Do you, when you're on the road, do you get, do you give your chance, yourself a chance to go out and, and run when you're out playing? <laughs> I do. I mean, if, if I, you know, normally, you know, it's like load in two, you'd maybe check between three and four and then you've got this window of time until you've got to be back, you know, to the venue or whatever. And then usually in that time is when I'll, if the weather's bad or I can't find a, you know, a good route, I'll, yeah. I'll do the treadmill. I don't know if you're like me. I hate the treadmill. I can't it's not stand my favorite running. place to run. Hate it. Yeah. But yeah, I do. I, I do try to run when I'm on the road, especially on, on performance days. I think it really helps me a lot to, to go do that workout before I go sing. That's so, so funny because I've had, there's been other schools of thought on this because I ask this question to a lot of the people who come on here. And some people will say, you know, I don't want to run on a school day, you know, or what, whatever you want to call it, or show day because they think that takes your mind off your focus and to each their own, of course, sure. I'm of the mind. Uh, I, I, we're like-minded in the fact that I think it enhances my ability to focus for the show. So, and it, and what it does is it 
clears my mind. It gets me away from my phone. Uh, and for me, it does the same thing as it does for you. And it just helps with the stresses of everything you've got to do. Now, look, you, you're the star and you have so much going on. I, do you wish that you were running back, uh, you know, like in the early nineties and mid nineties when you had all these number ones and the pressures of the business? Do you, do you wish that you could have told yourself, man, you should have, you know, someone could have told you that you should have run in those days. Absolutely. I, I think it, it would have really helped me mentally during all that because, you know, I mean, somebody that young carrying that weight and, you know, uh, a lot of people don't know how hard it is to have that much focus on you when you and you've got this immense uh, pressure to, you know, you've got this 90 minute show and you're playing an arena or whatever. And you, all these eyeballs are on. That's a lot of pressure to deal with. And um, I think that would have definitely uh, helped a lot to, to, you know, had that that tool of being able to go out and run like that. Did you do anything back in those days, physical? Were you? Did you have enough time? I'll tell you, uh, one of the guys that was a, a major influence on just working out, period, and, and which is how we know, each, not how we know each other, but I know him because of you, uh, Joey Finger, was oh, yeah. a huge influence on me. He was kind of that, remember that? old Mary Melody's cartoon where I'm going to date us here, but remember the, it was like the big bulldog. His name was Butch and the little dog was always yep. messing with him. He was like, Hey Spike, come on, let's go. You know, that was Joe. Joe was like nudging me in my bunk going, Hey, they got a nice workout facility here at the hotel. Let's right. go. I mean, he was just on me all the time. And he was the one that sort of taught me how to work out correctly. We did do some running back then, hmm. but it, I remember it just being loathsome. I mean, I hated every second that we <laughs> ran. And I think it was my shoes more than anything. Wow. I had no idea how, how, how much of an, an importance shoes played in that, uh, you know, or I may have become a, a runner back then, but Joe was a big influence on me health wise and, and workout wise. That's kind of a funny story. So the guy he's mentioning, Joe Finger, he's a regular on Funk Friday, he's played, I don't know how many, 10 of the Funk Fridays. and uh, Which are awesome, by the way. Oh, you I, like those? I, oh, yeah. I, I got to get you to on one. You got to play on one. Oh, well, that's going to happen. All right. So Joe is a dear friend of mine. He's living in L.A. I'm hanging out with, with Brian in Nashville with Rick Barron. You were looking for a drummer. I think you were still living in your old house. Uh, the old Derek band house. Yeah. And you were doing auditions and I went, I didn't know how to quite approach this, you know, to put one of your dear friends name into the hat. But I just, you know, and back in those days, I'm like, bah, why not tell him? Right. And I did. And you're like, well, sure. Well, let's give him a shot. And I called Joe on the phone. I said, what are you doing right now? He said, nothing. I said, go pick up Brian White's this, that, the other thing. Get on a plane and get your butt to Nashville. He shows up. He goes in for the audition. Rick Barron, this other friend of mine, and I are sitting outside like parents, you know, with their kid auditioning. <laughs> and uh, I don't remember if you decided right away or you waited a day, but long story short, and maybe you can interject something in this, but he got the gig. You should tell me your side of that story. I can still, we didn't have any production in this garage. It was my old house in Green Hills, which I wish I had never sold because it was such a cool house. But I had already, I had either moved here or I was moving here. I think I was already here in, in this home, but we basically just had a kit in the garage. And I mean, maybe just a few things, maybe an amp and I mean, just hardly anything. And, uh, I remember Joe showed up. We had like two or three guys come by that day and we were just like, Oh my God, this is awful. You know? <laughs> and Joe walked in and, you know, just literally lit up the room and he played everything great. I mean, I could just, I mean, I'm so, I'm so uh, critical, you know, when it comes to drummers and, you know, you could just tell Joe was just a, a, 
a master and he, he played the country stuff really well. And then he, and then we, you know, just played you know some funky stuff for a while and, and had fun. But I knew immediately, I, I knew it was, it was like, I didn't have to think about it. It was like, Oh my God, we, we, we got to hire this guy. So, and he was, he sang really well too. So it was, he was kind of a, a, a double thread. He, he did, he did, you know, two different things really well. And, and, and plus, personality wise when we just hit it off so well i gotta tell this story I, oh please this is this is this is just a, a evidence of of the humility that comes over over you know with age um we were playing his first gig i mean his first gig was the target center in, in minneapolis you were there and yeah, i was i think you got out and played b3 on something uh and we didn't really know each other that well yet. We were all kind of getting to know each other. And we, and, uh, and Joe did so well. It was such a fun, just epic gig. Um, and I said something so stupid on stage. I, I said, it's so great to be in the land of a thousand lakes. And you know, it was like, <laughs> it was like crickets, man. It's like a sea of crickets, like nothing, you know, people just kind of had that. Did he say a thousand? You know, and then after we're done with the gig, I come back in the locker room and and Joe, you know, we're all kind of unwinding and talking about the show. And Joe is like hysterically laughing. And he tells me later nowadays, he was like, I was afraid I I wasn't sure whether to say anything or laugh about it or what, because he said, I didn't know you. I didn't know if I was going to get fired if I said anything. And and he goes, dude, that, that land of a thousand lakes. And I was just like, what? He goes, Dude, it, it's land of ten thousand lakes, and, I, and I, just, I was mortified. I mean, you back then, I was so self conscious, and it just mortified me. And and he put his arm around me, and he's laughing. I mean, I know you can see that laugh. Of course, and Joe's got his arm around me. He goes, "Don't worry about it, man. You're only off nine thousand. Don't worry about it." <laughs> <laughs> Oh, man, that's yeah. so good. And I that was, was always that guy, too. If there was something that could be said wrong or the wrong city or I was always that guy. So I've got one more for you. OK, Come on with it. OK. Uh, first of all, uh, let me let me backtrack a little bit. So uh, I've known Brian a long time. I started going out on the road with him. Maybe we'll have time to go back and talk about how we met. But he long story short, he came to town to play a gig. He came out to see me because you're a Prince fan, Big. right? Yeah. So, so we met, we hung out. He said, yeah, why don't you come out on the road sometime and hang out? And I actually showed up. And I think your band was like, what's going on here? <laughs> but you invited me. I hung out on the bus. I sat in. We funk out at uh, you know on the uh, sound checks. And anyways, we became fast friends. And so I pop out from time to time. And there was one other story that is so classic. And hopefully this is still funny to you, but that's, I'm scared. What, I don't know what it is. I, well, you, you did I'm a gig afraid. in Memphis. You did a gig in Memphis. Oh my God. <laughs> <laughs> and we had a little spelling problem with the word Memphis and you were singing about it <laughs> on stage. Let me hear you say M M E E P P H I S Memphis. Yeah, that made me so proud. I was oh so proud. God. I'm like, oh. I'll never forget that. We were playing, we were going into a, song, a tune, but we were playing, uh, we were playing high fashion, bro. Were you really? We were playing high fashion at like leading into one of my songs because mm. we were like, oh man, we'll really impress Paul. We'll be playing one of his songs. You know, I was, I was that way. I was always trying to sort of nod the hat to people I respected, which you were, I was immediately a huge fan of yours, but, um, and we did that whole thing and I was kind of chanting and chanting Memphis, but I spelled it wrong. And you came up on the bus, you had a manager or something with you. I remember, and you came up on the bus and, uh, and you were like, guys, it sounded awesome. It was great. It's so awesome. I mean, you loved the show. It was great. And like you, you were, had this elation uh, going on. And then like just, just like your poker face, you went like you were like this, and then you went, Mephis. <laughs> <laughs> 
You went from, I was just. Memphis? <laughs> just like that. I swear to God, I'll never forget it. So, Oh, buddy, we've had some good times out there, man. Classic, Woo! yeah. All right, so we got to talk about your family a little bit. We got to talk about growing up in Oklahoma, your mom and dad musical, right? Yes. So did they groom you intentionally to become a professional musician or were they were both professional musicians? Is that right? Correct. Okay, so they so music is around your house all the time. What 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 kind of stuff are are they playing at this point in time when you're a kid growing up? Well, I always tell people they were the first celebrities that I encountered as a kid. So they were always larger than life to me. Mm -hmm. I, I always had a reverence for my parents, which is, I mean, I'm sure I went through a phase where they weren't that cool to me, but for the most part, I, I always really looked up to them and uh, they were divorced in 79. And my dad always had a, had an affinity for uh, you know, I, my parents were really kind of an amalgamation of everything. Um, I mean, I've got 45s of them doing, uh, you know, the Supreme stuff. And my dad's doing, uh, thank you for letting me be myself on a 45 wow. record. And, and then my dad kind of got bit by the, the, you know, Jessica and, and the Allman brothers and, you know, that whole Southern rock thing. And then something happened in the early eighties with Merle Haggard. And my dad just like became this huge Merle fan. And, and then my mom was always a huge, you know, she, they, they had to play all this different style of music because they, that they had to eat. So, uh, but so I, I would be at my mom's house one weekend and I'd, my mom would be, learning and writing down the lyrics to, uh, you know, uh, Kenny Log and stuff, you know, uh, from the Vox Humana record. And, sure. and then, you know, my dad's working on, so, you know, I go to his house and I hear totally other side of the, you know, fence so, as far as music goes. And so I grew up kind of in this melting pot of so many great things. And, and I really attribute that to why, my records have always sounded the way they sound and kind of my vocal style was kind of this, you know, it was kind of, it came from all of that stuff, but um, no, they, they didn't coach me to, to be a musician necessarily. They weren't the type of parents that were like, you know, what are you, what are you going to do? Or, you know, like you need to really practice harder or, you know, that it wasn't really that. I, I, I think they knew that I was, I, I had a musical, sense about me early on. And, 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 uh, I think sometime around my 10 or 11 or 12 age, I, I started kind of jumping in and playing drums with my dad every now and then, and then my mom every now and then. And, uh, so I think that was sort of the first little, uh, kind of nod from them that, Hey, you know, you're, you've, you know, obviously, you know, they're not going to ask you to be a part of something if it's awful. So, yeah you know, it, that was kind of their way of giving me that first little, uh, you know, word of affirmation was letting me be a part of what they were doing. And then I got better and, yeah. and started getting into playing guitar and singing and wanting to write songs and, and developed, you know, my vocal style started happening and, you know, uh, but I wouldn't say they were grooming me necessarily, okay. but, but maybe they were indirectly, you know, they were giving you the opportunities that, just one of the like byproducts like of that. Yeah. Like your whole family, it's the same yeah. thing. You know, you had to start somewhere and they, you know, I, I have so many very vivid memories of just playing in clubs and different things with my parents. And I remember it just being so, I mean, just being asked to, to go play was such a, I mean, you know how that feels when oh, yeah. you're young. I was just like, Oh my, you know, my whole day, my whole week was anticipating that one night. Right. I just couldn't wait, you know. Did you do that all through high school then? I did. Okay. And when did you decide that this is really going to be my call, or this is my calling? I need to make my way down to to uh, uh, Nashville. Did, was that something that happened right around those times? or uh, when, when did that decision-making happen? Um. 
So I heard this guy named Steve Warner when I was about 14. And uh, that was a real defining moment for me too. He's kind of, to me, I always explain to people that don't know anything about Steve, I'll say, well, he was kind of my Glenn Campbell. He was really a triple threat. Mm -hmm. Great, great vocalist, great tone, great phrasing, ex exceptional guitar playing, great you know, songwriter. Um, I heard him and, and something sort of clicked for me. I, I kind of had my, my muse, if you will. I went, oh, that's, that's what I want to sound like. And that's the kind of music I want to make. Mm -hmm. um, so that was a defining moment for me. When I was uh, 18, 17 or 18, uh, my dad called me and he said, uh, uh, Joe Settlemyers, who is a get really renowned guitarist in Oklahoma City, jazz guy, who gave me my first two lessons, he called me and said, uh, uh, Joe uh, said that Billy Joe Walker Jr. is, is looking for talent. And he's wanting to move into you know, producing and Billy's a, you know, an exceptional guitar player that's played on everybody's records from, you know, the Beach Boys to Lionel Richie to, you know, I mean, you name it, just one of those kind of guys. And, and uh, I had two demos of a couple of things that I had written. You remember those uh, cassettes uh, where like, they were like, remember at state fairs where you'd go in and you could sing oh, your yeah. favorite song, mm -hmm. that kind of thing. Sure. Well, that was kind of one of my first, experiences in the studio my mom got me a gig singing at this studio in Oklahoma City where you I would sing the reference vocal you know mm -hmm. on, so my vocal would be on one side and the instrumental would be on the other and I convinced the studio to do a trade out for a couple of things that I had written that I wanted to cut with a band and uh, long story short those two demos that I did uh, that I basically ate my check to trade out to to do a couple of songs that I'd written, which were not great, but I think they showcased my voice enough. And those ultimately were the songs that, uh, you know, I sent them to Billy, this guitar producer here in Nashville. And that's ultimately long in, in a roundabout way. That's kind of how I got to Nashville and how I got a deal and how I got going. Because Billy was the guy that, ushered me in, developed me and wow. took me in and, and, uh, and got me my first deal and produced my first, uh, three records. So that's a, that's a big move though. Were you, you went down there by yourself. Did you know anybody besides those guys? I knew a couple of people, but not, not very many people. Wow. Um, I just kind of had that. I don't know. You, I love watching the, uh, Jaws is one of my favorite movies, but I like watching the commentary and watching the interviews, the making of, and I like listening to Steven Spielberg talk. Mm -hmm. And he said one of the things he remembers the most about Jaws is he would he said it's it was a combination. He said uh, he was it was a combination of courage and stupidity, and it all ex exists. He thinks of those two things existing underwater, and um, I think my moving to Nashville was a little bit of courage and stupidity. I just didn't know any better, but I had a strong enough pull into it. I had an intuitiveness about, it just felt so powerful to me that I just felt like I was supposed to be there. I didn't really know if I was going to be an artist or not. I just felt like I needed to be here and be, I felt like I was supposed to be here, whether it was uh, to be a drummer or, or, you know, a background singer or whatever. I, I just knew, I, I felt like I needed to be here and, and it just, it was so powerful. It pulled me here, you know. The confidence to be able to go do that is unbelievable. I don't know whether you said stupidity, but I think it's, I think it's self-confidence being a 20 year old, not knowing any better. Yes. But going down there saying, you know, I got this. I mean, I, sometimes I wish I had a little bit of that 20 year old. I could just bring, Right back, you know. Uh, Me too. Me too, because I don't think I would do that now. <laughs> I, if I knew then what I know now, yeah, it would be a whole different story. Oh, so you are thrust into the limelight pretty much right away. I mean, that first record. Um, what was it like hearing yourself on the radio for the first time? Oh, man, it's just uh, otherworldly, you know. I, it's, no, it's, it's really hard to explain. I, I remember where I was. I was in between uh, Phoenix and Tucson, Arizona, 
and I was on a radio tour and I heard myself on the radio and it was just, you know, it, it always sounded so different to me then, you know, when you heard it on the radio, cause it, sometimes they would VSO it up a little bit and it had all oh. this, this, you know, the uh, compression was, you know, comp- I mean like way more compression than you were used to. And so it had this exciting sound when you heard yourself on the radio, but it was, it was just so cool. You know, it was just so, uh, neat to hear this work that you've worked on for months, you know, it's like you're getting to hear it uh, and know that there are hundreds of other people listening to it as well. It's it's exciting. Did you have any idea what you were getting yourself into? I had no idea. <laughs> absolutely no idea. You know, my, my brass ring then was I got a record deal and I got to cut a record and, and my parents, I, I remember the label asking me where I wanted, you know, CDs mailed to and posters. And, and I specifically mailed them to my mom and my dad and my grandparents. And right. to me, that was it. I was like, okay, well they, I got to show them that I came all the way up here and, and I did this. I and did this it. I did really, it. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's man, That was the full man manifestation of my dream right there. So I didn't even think past that, you know? Wow. Did you have fun during those initial years? Did you do you recall that as being a fun point in your life? Wow, that's a great question. Um, I think I think yes and no. I mean, I think there were there were times where it was really fun. I used to tell people when I had when I felt the the most free was when I was on stage because I knew for that seventy five to 90 minutes management and label and, you know, nobody could touch me. I was, I felt kind of invincible when I was up there. I didn't, I, a lot of times I didn't want to come off stage because I knew that all the BS was going to start as soon as I, you know, it's like, the, you know, that it, that was the hardest part was, was that stuff. All the, 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 the work and the legwork was not fun. And I always felt like um, my team I never felt like we took time to really celebrate the successes. I felt like it was always like, as soon as we had something good happen, it was like, okay, cool. We've got to outdo that. You know, you always felt like it was just like this constant train moving where we, I, I always felt like, wait, 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 wait. This was really cool that this thing that just happened, can we just kind of hang out here for a little bit? We And we couldn't, it was always, well, we need another, you know, Rebecca Lynn, or we need to, you know, it was like this constant machine that was moving and, and you felt, you know, like the, it sounds cliche, but you really are getting pulled from multiple directions. And I remember one time I off the cuff, just, I decided I wanted to go fly to see my mom. I just went, bought it back when you could just drive to the airport and get on a plane. And, right. and I flew to see my mom and everybody flipped out because they didn't know where I was. And I didn't announce it to anybody, but I was over it. I was like, I, I want to go see my mom. I want to go hang out and, yeah. and uh, see my mom and, and eat Mexican food. You know, that's <laughs> what I wanted to do. And people literally flipped out, but uh, I'm going, I'm kind of going off on a rabbit trail here, but I think there were moments that were really fun. I mean, times like, you know, when you would come out on the road and, and we just knuckleheads just goofing off and going to eat sushi and, you know, pl- long sound checks where we just played whatever we wanted. That, that was the stuff that was fun. And, and, yeah. you know, but it, it was the, the, the pressure type stuff, the, the, the tedious, you know, the legwork kind of really, uh, that kind of stuff that kind of wore me out that, that I, I wasn't really strong enough back then as a personality to step in and go, you know, what, I need a break. And I, I think if I could go back, that would be the one thing I would have done a little bit more of was just say, you know what? I mean, work hard until until it's time to release your record or whatever, and and just a lot. I wish I would have allotted more time for you know a little more me time back then. Well, you were on top of the world, number one hits, to, uh, lots of award shows, a Grammy. Get out with Saint Paul. I mean, oh. <laughs> come on. <laughs> hey, you and I had a lot of fun. You know what? You did take time out to hang out with me. Hopefully that was fun for you. Uh, but we we really, I think in those days, you needed someone to tell you it was okay to 
to have fun and just quit for a minute and hang out with your buddies. I mean, you were really always, if I remember correctly, always super tight with your band. And you guys were complete knuckleheads, which, of course, I loved and, and fell right in with. So that did that really become your family out there and your support system? Was it your band that helped you out? Yeah, I think so. That was the, they were always the people that just told me like it was. I mean, we would, sometimes we would all get in, you know, arguments because, you know, I, they would, they didn't have a filter. And I, you know, looking back, I'm grateful for that. They, they wouldn't have let it, they wouldn't have ever let my head explode. And when right. it, when it came close to it, they were always the ones to step in and go, man, who, please who do you think you are, you know, yeah, that kind please. of stuff. And so yeah. they were a great, uh, they were great for me. And, and there, there were some things that, you know, were not so great. I was so impressionable, you know, a lot of times looking back, I, I had my opinions about stuff, but I, I was, you know, I would, I allowed myself to be, you know, to have someone else, someone else's in, in you know, opinion influence me. Uh, and, you know, but I was young. So, but very grateful for the, the tightness of the band. And we were, we were competitive, you know, we were really competitive when we did shows with people. We, we had a, we had something to prove. We had a point to make. And um, I think that was good. I think that showed, you know, and we weren't like vindictive or, mm -hmm. or you know, like mean about it. We, we just wanted people to know that we were, we were the stuff. We were the deal, you know. What a great period of time. It's been so fun to be sitting in, you know, being being your big bro and watching from the time that you came and saw me was that the early nineties all, all the way through those great wonderful successful years and then some of the not so successful years right that right. and that's just that's what the journey is in the music business it's not just glitz twenty four seven I mean there is a it's it's a tough life, man. And you know, for me watching you going through the great stuff was that was wonderful. It's hard for your big bro to watch you go through the struggles that you went through, and you're very transparent about that. And I've I've looked at interviews in the work you're doing now. Even it's it's I think it's important for people to know that it's okay to talk about depression and uh, deal with that. Uh, were you ever embarrassed to talk about that? Or is that something you're just like, Hey, I need to talk about this now. I want to get better. How does it? I, I think I was, a, you know, definitely afraid to, to be transparent in, in, in the beginning, um, you know, beginning of the two thousands. Um, but I think, you know, the, again, certain things come with age and, and um, you know, I've been through a good amount of therapy that's sort of uh, helped me to, to, to be more comfortable and, and about talking about it and, and realizing that, you know, you, you only get better by talking about it, you know, and uh, for all of the uh, believers out there, we, we disarm the enemy every time we, we talk about it. So um, uh, I think a little bit more freedom comes to all of us when we uh, are, are able to share what we're going through with other people, you know, how do you think you've got through that period besides talking about it? Was it your faith that really I think helped you? My faith was, was a big part of it. You know, my wife, my friends, uh, you and I have so many things in common. Uh, oh yes. With, with regards to, you know, our, our voice and certain things that we've dealt with and it, yep. it helped so much to find common ground with people. You know, I mean, I have so much empathy for uh, people that, that struggle with certain things in their life. Uh, I just, I just, I, my heart really goes out to, to them. And I think you, you, unless you have some sort of thing that you go through, you don't, you, I don't, you know, you, you look at life differently and you look at people and there, you kind of, you kind of want to carry people's weight because you, you know, you already know pain and you know, struggling. So you're like, can, what can I do to help you? You know? Um, so Yeah. I think it's great that you're 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 so transparent and giving advice and being open about it. It 
Because you're right. It's the only way that we get better. Is and I don't, I don't mind saying anything about it too, Paul. I'm sure your listeners are like, what's he talking about? Well, again, pressures of, of my industry, uh, you know, really took its toll on me in a lot of ways. And I, I think, I think vocally it, it affected me a great deal. Confidence wise, it affected me a great deal. I, I struggled, uh, with some vocal issues, uh, in the late nineties, early two thousands, I think some of it was because of pressure. And I've, I've since learned, uh, I, you know how we just keep learning more and more about our ourselves and as we go through life and in our journey. But I think some of my, uh, struggles that I had, um, vocally, I'm finding out that they, uh, had to do with, uh, some herniated discs and, and bulging discs that are in my neck, which were due to uh, lifting weights in the late nineties. Um, wow. And and that's, you know, I learned from uh, this chiropractor I've been doing some spinal decompression stuff with. He said uh, a couple of years ago, he said, you're a C three, four and five, keep your diaphragm alive. And, you know, kind of another illuminating moment for me. I, I didn't realize that your neck was so connected to your diaphragm. And so, you know, that I think it was maybe sort of a, an amalgamation of, of maybe multiple things that sort of played into that. And then, you know, of course, you know, de- depression comes from, from that kind of stuff too, and anxiety, because that's your instrument and it's, you know, that's how you express yourself. And, and uh, so, um, you know, that was a, a really tough time. And, uh, you know, I'm still in the, in the fight and still on the journey, but, um, I think just, uh, just being, uh, open about it and, and, uh, letting it take you where it needs to take you. Uh, I, th- I think it's, I think it's definitely making me better overall. Um, you know, cause we, we learn more in the, in the valleys than we do when we're on top of the mountain. So, yeah, I didn't know if you run, wanted to go down that road. So I appreciate you saying, Paul, would you just <laughs> let me just say what you're trying to say, would you? It's, because we didn't talk about that before. And, and I appreciate you taking the ball there and, and, and saying that you and I share that similar issue with our voice. I mean, I, I talked openly about my voice problems with my with the fans of the show in my very first episode and it it can be debilitating to not be able, for me in my instances my speaking voice goes in and out and i tell you it is it it's very hard to sometimes go out in public cuz you don't want to risk not having a voice when you struggle with voice issues you overthink things and over complicate things and play tricks on your mind, which sets you down this path of, uh, I, it's not feeling sorry for yourself. It's, 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 it's depression, it's anxiety. And it, it's, it's really tough and dealing with it, even going to therapy and to try to get better makes you look at that. And sometimes you don't want to look at that. It's a vicious cycle and it's been great to have you, as my ally on that, have you tried this? Have you tried that? What about doing this? So that that's been good. It's the it's the uh, what do we call it? The I can't talk and I can't sing podcast. That's what we're. Do- <laughs> well, that's not true, as we all both know, man. You still sing your your butt off. I've you you've been coming to Minneapolis quite a bit, at least before COVID, and and doing a a solo gig up here. Your Minneapolis fans love you. Is this always been a hotbed for you? I'm glad you brought that up because I, I definitely wanted to say something about that. I, um, I can't put my finger on on it, but I will I, I will say that my biggest uh, following has always been in 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 the in the Minneapolis area, but Minnesota in general. Uh, back when record selling was a thing, we. <laughs> you know, collectively sold more, we had more activity as far as record sales go in, in Minnesota than any other state in the entire U S. And um, so it's, I, I think that's why my heart is, I always tell 
people I feel like a transplant there. I, my heart is really always, you know, there. I, I love the fans there. I've met so many people. I've got so many great friends, you being one of them. I have such a, a, a great community of friends. And, and uh, I mean, I, I, I call all you guys family there in, in, in Minneapolis and so many great memories. It's just such a great city. I mean, it's just, I've got so much, many great memories over the past 20 something years. And I always anticipate coming there to play. So, well, we're, we were supposed to play a gig together last year, I believe. I hope that you and I have an opportunity to, to play this year or at the very least in 22. Yeah. But you know what you got to do? I'm going to look for an in person race. If you're comfortable, come up. The bedroom's still here. It's still got your name on it. Uh, come stay with me. Let's run a race this year. I'm in. Yeah. I'm in. Do it. Yeah. Tell me what uh, you, what you have on your schedule. You, you're doing some touring right now, and have you got dates booked all the way through summer? I am. I'm. I'm That's a killer. I don't want to speak too soon, but it's my it, people can check out my calendar right now. Just go to brianwhite.com and you can see all of the the dates. I'm uh, working up until September, um, and I'm some of the dates are my dates, but I'm also on a multi artist tour right now with uh, people kind of from my era. We're out doing a, a tour together right now. Actually, I leave tonight. Dude, I haven't been on a bus in I don't know how long. I, I, really? I, I'm still trying to figure out how to sleep on it um, <laughs> and, how, and how to pee at, in, in the middle of the night. <laughs> so, but uh, no, I number two. Tonight, yeah, yeah, going to uh, going to Macon tonight and, right. uh, and then playing in uh, West Columbia, South Carolina on Saturday. So I'm, I'm so thrilled to be out traveling and playing. I've had some really good uh, – vocal nights too. I haven't, I didn't mention that, but I've, I've really, you know, been singing good and feeling really good about it. You know, it's, it's great to be up there with artists that they've had a lot of success, but they, they've lived a lot too. They've had a lot of life go down and and we relate to each other in a lot of ways. And and you feel that camaraderie up there and, Mm -hmm. and you don't have this big long show and you're not really carrying the whole show. It, you're all doing it together and, and you're, you know, pl- pl- playing maybe five or six tunes. And so it's, it's really, it's really a fun. Experience. Sounds like fun. Yeah. Well, do me a favor give Erica and the boys, my love, please come up to Minnesota. You know how we love you here. You are family. You are my little bro. Ladies and gentlemen, Brian white, that's going to do it. Thanks Thank for you. Me. Oh, I love having you, man. And uh, we'll uh, we'll be seeing you really hey, I soon. I just want now. you to know I'm I'm butting in here, and that's so yeah. rude of me. That's it's okay. Not very not very southern of me, but uh, <laughs> I was at my kids. My wife and I were at my kids' uh, track meet yesterday here in in Brentwood, and we were walking uh, before the race started, and there was a, a a front bumper with the Prince symbol on it, and it was purple. And I, I should have took a picture of it and sent it to you. And I looked at the girl and I was like, I just kind of gave her the thumbs up. And I said, I, I, I said, I bet I've spent more money than you have on his records. And she goes, I don't know. It, oh, it was man. just a great moment. So just let you know, uh, there's a purple family here in Nashville, too. I'll come down there and play my show then. Come on. Let's all do right. it. I'll play tambourine or tour manage. <laughs> you can do all of the above. Thanks, little bro. You too. That's it for this episode of Music on the Run, number 35. My uh, great friend, Brian White. We'll see you in a couple of weeks. Music on the Run was hosted by yours truly, St. Paul Peterson. Edited and produced by my buddy, Davide Razzo. Artist relations by Owen Sartori. Video editing by Tanner Montague. And a very special thanks to the people who financially support this podcast. And remember, don't give up now. We're almost home free.